Welcome friends. In this video, we're going to do leak code number 37, Sudoku Solver. We're given a partially solved Sudoku grid and asked to fill in the remaining values with a solution to the board. We're also told to fill in the board in place and that there is guaranteed to be one solution to the board. In case you aren't familiar with the game of Sudoku, you can read the rules in the problem description, but I assume that if you went to the trouble to look up this video on YouTube, you've probably already read the game rules. So right off the bat, this is a brute force backtracking solution. You might be wondering how we know it's a brute force problem and not something more sophisticated like dynamic programming. Well, one way to tell is that in DP problems, the answers to the subparts contribute substantially to the answers in the next subpart. In this problem, however, take a look here between the six and the eight, right here. Knowing the answers to all the other cells in the same block as well as the other answers to the cells in the same column and the same row, don't actually tell us what this value should be. The existing numbers definitely help us narrow down what the answer could be, but we're not gonna know for certain until the entire board is filled out. For example, let's say that we actually did fill in the entire row and column, and we determined that this value was like a one, this, this yellow value was a one. But then let's say that we, we ended up finding out that this, Oops, excuse me, let me change the color. Let's say that this value ended up conflicting with this value over here, which means that the entire row is invalid and therefore the yellow block could no longer be the number one. So we don't know for certain whether the yellow block, the yellow cell is going to be a number one until the entire board is filled. That's a sign that our solution here is to brute force check every single configuration of the board. So here is the general structure for backtracking problems such as this one, where we need to brute force check every single solution. We define a recursive method that takes in some representation of the subproblem. Then we loop through every single candidate value for that possible subproblem. We tentatively save the candidate value in our result. And again, result is abstractly just some sort of place where we store our result. If the result is valid for this current configuration and we recurse on the next subproblem and recursing on the next subproblem returns a true solution, then we return true. Otherwise, we continue looping through the candidate values until we find someone that returns a true. If none of the candidate values work, then we erase candidate value from result and then return false. The reason that we need this extra erase candidate value from result is that we only hit that case if none of the candidate values worked for the current subproblem. That means that one of the previous subproblems we solved must have been incorrect. So we need to erase all the guesses we made on the Sudoku board after that incorrectly filled cell. Now let's jump into this in Java. First, let's define a class field accessible to all methods called result. As the name suggests, our final result will be stored here. Let's also define a Boolean array called modifiable. As the name suggests, modifiable will tell us whether the cell at each index is modifiable. All the cells that have already been given to us in the input are not modifiable, and all others are. The first thing we'll want to do is populate the modifiable array. Oh, excuse me, I just realized that these were in the method. Let's move these to the to be class fields. The first thing we'll want to do is populate the modifiable array. So we'll define a method called mark modifiable and loop through our result array. We'll mark values that are already populated in board as not modifiable and mark the others as modifiable. Now, let's call this method from our main method. And next, we'll call a recursive method with a single index zero. This method does not exist yet, but basically this method will take in an index from zero up to but not including 81, indicating which cell we're currently looking at. We'll number the cells in the board from left to right, top to bottom. Now, if you look at this board, and we say that we're numbering these, num these cells from zero to 81, 
uh, left to right, top to bottom, that means that this cell is zero, this cell is one, this cell is two, this cell is three, this cell is four, and so on and so forth. So given a singular number from zero to 81, how do I find the row and column indices associated with that singular number? Well, the answer is that we can get the row and index by floor dividing and taking the index modulo nine, respectively. So for example, I could do int row equals index divided by nine, and I can also do int column equals index divided, uh, modulo nine, excuse me. And now let's loop through our candidates numbers one up to, but not including 10. So we can do something like for int candidate, if the current index is a modifiable index, we'll tentatively mark the cell value as candidate. If the cell is valid and the rest of the board can be filled in with row of column marked with candidate, we'll return true. We'll define what is valid means in just a moment. Now, if the current index is not modifiable, then we don't need to bother checking candidates for it, so we just recurse and move on to the next subproblem. Now, referring back to our template, if we have tried all possible values and none of them work, then we need to erase the candidate from our result and then return false. How do we erase in this case? Well. Since a valid Sudoku board only has values one through nine, we'll just use a number that's not in that domain. So we'll use the number zero as a proxy for an empty value. This is nice since the default value for an initialized interray is zero as well. We have one more addition to this method at the beginning. If the index passed in is 81, what does that mean? Think about it and pause the video. I'll reveal the answer in three, two, one. The answer is that we should return true because we'll only ever hit this case if we reach this line and the 80th index is valid. The 80th index is the final cell we need to fill in in the very bottom right of the Sudoku grid. If the 80th index is the final cell we need to fill in and we found a valid candidate for that cell, then that means we have a valid board. So if we're able to call recurse on 80 plus one, that means that we have a solution and therefore we should return true. Cool, so that's actually all the backtracking part of this problem. Let's fill in how we check whether a candidate was valid for a cell. Here, we'll also call some methods that we haven't defined yet, but should make sense based on their names. A candidate value is valid only if it's valid in its row, its column, and its block where a block is the local three by three square in which a cell resides. First, let's fill in is valid row. We'll create a Boolean array with 10 values. We'll say that the nth index in this Boolean array is true if we have seen n in this row. For example, if we've seen the number one in this row, then index one in seen will be true. So we'll loop through the row given by the row index i and look at the values that we see. If the value we find has already been seen and that value is not zero, because remember, we're using zero as a proxy for an empty cell, then we return false because in Sudoku, each value from one to nine can only appear at most once in a row. Otherwise, we'll mark seen value as true. And if we've checked that every non-zero value that appears in the row is unique, then we return true. The logic for is valid column will be very similar. Let's copy and paste and just make a few adjustments. Instead, we'll get a fixed column index J and we'll loop through our result board result board with an incrementing row index instead of a column index. And finally, let's implement is valid block. Here, one tricky part is getting our row and column indices correct. 
we'll fill, fill that in last. But the core logic with the scene Boolean array is the same, so we can fill that part in first. Now, let's think carefully about our indices. Each block begins at row index 0, 3, and 6. Similarly, the column indices of these blocks also begin at column index 0, 3, and 6. So that tells you that the starting point for this looping should begin at some value times 3. It turns out that that something is simply the raw index 4 divided by 3. For example, row index 2 4 divided by 3 is 0, and 0 times 3 is 0, which is the correct starting row index for the top left block. The same logic applies to the column indices. And then, the upper bound for both row and column indices in the current block is simply going to be the starting row and column plus 3, since each block is 3 cells wide and 3 cells tall. So that logic is pretty much done, but we're missing one more piece. This is actually a lead code quirk. The method here actually returns void, so we need to mutate the input argument with our result but the input argument has type car. So let's just loop through our result board and convert our integers into cars. And now we can run the code and check if it works. Ah, I have a mis mismatch type here. So let's just call this a car instead. Oops, and we also need to call this a boolean, excuse me. We need to have it return a boolean value, excuse me. Let me just double check everything else. Okay, let's go ahead and run one more time. Still, I think... Uh... Ah, I misspelled candidate. I think it's another... Another typo. Oh, this should be is valid block, excuse me. And this guy is missing a column less than. And there we have it. So the sanity, uh, the base case has worked. Let's just see if all of them work. Cool, and there you have it. Uh, that's how you solve Sudoku. I'll see you in the next video.